So hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, roundtable on uh, open science and management research, future trends and challenges. Uh, my name is Christine Mauser, I'm an associate professor at uh, Freie Universität Amsterdam. And I'm very happy to welcome today uh, my panelists who are Ginny Barber from the Queensland University of Technology, Maximilian Heimstedt, uh, Bielefeld University and Weizmann Institute, Michael Coleman from Elsevier, and we are still waiting for uh, Ernesto Santibanez Gonzalez from the University of Talca in Chile. Um, so all our speakers are experts on the topic of open science uh, in various uh, roles and uh, incarnations, so to say. Uh, Ginny has been, uh, I think, for a very long time worked on the on the different um, facets and dimensions of um, of uh, open science and is director of Open Access Australasia. Um, Maximilian researches actually open science uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, looking at um, uh, citizen science and collaborations between governments and, and the public. And Michiel is uh, for Elsevier working on uh, the future of open science. So for example, looking into um, how we can share data sets uh, and how we should actually govern uh, this whole future of um, open science. So uh, this panel will proceed as follows. All our speakers will have a, a, a short uh, amount of time to, uh, or short-ish amount of time to introduce their stance on open science to, uh, and to talk about what they deem uh, relevant and important for um, the future of open science uh, from their uh, particular perspective. And um, uh, I invite all of my panelists to uh, finish or finalize their own contribution with a, a provocation or a claim or maybe a statement on how we should proceed in the future. After that, I uh, warmly invite uh, you uh, as participants to uh, uh, contribute to the discussion and engage in the discussion either using the Q&A uh, or uh, raise your hand, uh, but I please uh, um, ask you to wait with questions until uh, the speakers have finished. So without further ado, I give the floor to Ginny, um, who will share her screen. Thank you very much. I will just share my screen. Great. So I hope that's all clear. So thank you very much for um, the kind introduction to uh, to speak to you all. So I will just start this by prefacing by saying I'm absolutely not an expert in management research. Um, my expertise is in open access, in open science and scholarly publishing. Um, my background previously was in medicine and medical publishing. So I'm coming to it from that perspective, but I um, hope very much to hear from you about how we might apply this to management to, to management science. So um, I just thought I'd, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the, the state of art at the moment and and to talk about some of the really high level policy things that have been happening. So, you know, it's been a pretty, um, pretty dramatic past three years in many different ways. But one of the ways in particular is uh, really substantial advances in open access and open science. And just starting from from the left, I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, so the first one is Plan S, which came out of a, a coalition of uh, organisations back in 2018 that got together to make a decision about making all the research that they funded immediately and openly available. Um, and that essentially came into effect at the beginning of 2021. So now if you're funded by any of these Coalition S funders, you have to make your research immediately and openly available, either in a journal or through a repository. So that's important, but critically also with an associated license. So this was a first and a very big move from a group of funders to make research open access. The second thing I'll just highlight is the um, uh, UNESCO Open Science recommendation. I'll come back to this in a little bit more detail. But again, this kicked off in 2019 through one of the um, one of the uh, member countries of UNESCO um, and proceeded through an international collaboration and consultation that really culminated last year in the recommendation being adopted at the UNESCO General Assembly. And it has really quite broad ramifications for how we think about openness across research more generally, and I will come back to that. But then, of course, we had uh, we had the pandemic, which uh, kind of really changed the whole debate around open science and open access in particular. Um, in, in a number of ways, I'll just highlight. So first off, 
uh, was this initiative called, which came to be called the COVID Open Research Dataset, the COD-19 dataset, which was launched by the US White House, Trump's White House, in collaboration with a number of uh, organizations globally to call for all research on COVID-19 to be made open. And it's one of the biggest open data sets of research that's been assembled. But it also at the same time, there were other policy initiatives happening. And the ones that I'll highlight, just highlighted here are, um, for example, in APEC, um, that there was a call there for a, a specific statement on open science. And even the G7, a group of uh, countries when they got together issued in their research compact a specific call and support for open science so this was really at the very highest level of uh, international thinking around open science so fast forward to 2022 and there's a couple of things really to note so first off is that um, you know, we had this call for open access to academic research around COVID back in 2020. But when we started to face yet another um, potential global emergency, that of monkeypox, it was clear that that, it, though, that research was not openly available. And so again, there was a call from the White House to make public, make that research publicly open. Um, and but the probably the most important thing happened just a couple of weeks ago, and this was a guidance came from the Office of Science and Technology Policy at President Biden's White House, which built on an initiative um, previously that was issued by President Obama back in 2013, saying now that all research that is funded by federal federal agencies in the US from 2026 will have to be made immediately and openly available. Um, and that will include the data behind it. So this is a real game changer in how we think about openness globally. So just going back to um, open science as defined by UNESCO, because I think that's probably the most important thing to think about. It's not just, um, it, it, it's a very comprehensive description of what open science is. So it includes open scientific knowledge, so that's open access. It also includes the infrastructures that support that open science open engagement with societal actors. And so where I am, for example, in Australia, that includes very importantly, um, association and working with indigenous perspectives. And then open dialogue with other knowledge systems. So for example, with citizen science. So it's a very comprehensive uh, dis uh, description of open science. And it's underpinned by a set of values and principles, which include quality and integrity. So that's a very important one. And also things such as uh, transparency and reproducibility. So we're not thinking about just openness as free to read. We're thinking about open science as a really kind of broad concept across the whole of uh, research. And sometimes you know, when I talk to people about UNESCO open science recommendations, it's often people get get caught up on the word science. Well, you know, so in Europe, science is often you know, known to understand to kind of include uh, the research across multiple disciplines. But for example, in some places people think about science as just being hard science as being sort of um, the maths and technology for example but it's very clear from the UNESCO recommendation that it was intended sorry it's intended that open science uh, would be um, would be inclusive and it specifically calls out the social sciences and humanities so this is the intention is that this recommendation applies to all of uh, research so how does this affect researchers in universities well um, kind of basically you can make your research uh, open in any kind of different way and that starts with the the methods perhaps and it can go for example through to the ways that you interact with journals with, through open peer review and even how through to how you develop textbooks and for example there's quite a number of countries including the US for example which is leading on open educational resources what can academics do? Well, individually, there's a number of different options. You can start with thinking about how you share your data. And obviously, there are challenges if you sit within uh, this uh, different disciplines. So sharing data is, is absolutely the norm in some disciplines. So for example, if you talk to astrophysicists, they, this is what they do. If you're handling qualitative data, that's a much more much, much bigger challenge. And I'd really be interested to hear about your perspectives on that, because this is some there are definitely some areas of open science that we really have not thought through all the issues to do with the practicalities of the openness. But you know, there are generally places uh, that you can publish research and that can either be uh, an early version of your paper or de uh, depositing in a, um, uh, a journal or in a, a, a repository. As I said, there's also options for making research more open through the peer review process and uh, developing open educational resources. 
But I really think that institutions are absolutely the core of this. So I think that without um, institutional support, there's a limit to what academics can do. So I think everything from having policies that support open science are very important, having the infrastructure such as supporting journals, but also for publication and data repositories and having strategies, you know, actually make it, baking this into the, the processes of the institution. But just really one thing to think about in all of this is that, and I, I think hopefully we'll touch on this a bit later, is that open science and doesn't sit on its own. So this is, comes from a, a, a blog on the um, a Declaration on Research Assessment uh, website, which I wrote with a couple of colleagues a couple of years ago. And we're talking there about open scholarship, which, which I'll use in the same way as open science here. And the point really here is that it has to be considered in the context of reform of research assessment. Unless we change that substantially, we're not really going to get open science happening uh, in a, any effective way. And we also have to think about the power structures within research, because otherwise we run the risk of having open science really reinforcing some of the really damaging power structures that we have right now and perhaps turning um, uh, it, making excluding people from their ability to publish. Um, so I'm just going to, the challenge that I've got here is that I think that, you know, it's very clear that open science is here to stay. We are now in a world where this is becoming the norm. Um, you know, we have large funders putting their weight behind this. So I think I would just to ask everyone here, we're thinking about what are the discipline appropriate actions you might be able to think about to integrate into your research and to, uh, to take an uh, individual step towards making your research open. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Um, I think the, that was very clear. Uh, lots of uh, information, which um, uh, perhaps for some of us was uh, already um, clear and for others perhaps less so. And I think your closing question is uh, very relevant, especially for management researchers. Uh, we talked about this previously, that uh, for especially for those of us who do qualitative research, that uh, there are some hiccups still and some issues which haven't been resolved yet, but uh, of course, that's also an opportunity to engage uh, and to shape the future of open science. Right, uh, another macro perspective on open science, I guess, is by Michiel. Um, you want to share your screen and see if it works, uh, Michiel? Yes, I will try. Uh, I was a bit struggling today. Uh, can you see the slides? Let's say there's a different display. You can see the slides, but not yet the presentation mode. Yes, perfect. Okay, anyway, very good. Go Thank ahead, you. Yeah, I also, I, I like, just like Jenny, to start with a disclaimer. Uh, so, uh, no, no authority whatsoever on management research. Um, my background is in astrophysics, although it was a long time ago. Um, and so I kind of grew up in a pretty open access, open science environment there, because astrophysicists um, have always been sharing information. They have been at the forefront of preprint servers. They kind of introduced it together with high energy physics. Uh, and of course, all the data that we gather on telescopes and satellites is uh, freely available to everybody. Um, it's like a six month uh, delay and then everybody it's in the public domain. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in that way, uh, very open science in, in, in character, even uh, avant la lettre, I would say. Great. So I go to the next slide and, and a bit of a, you know, a caveat here. Uh, they're, they're a little bit dry. These are our, pro, uh, you know, professional slides we share, but I hope to kind of add some personal uh, flavor to it. Um, I was involved in open access a long time ago, uh, but today I'm not really an expert, but I was far more excited about the other elements of open science. So that's why I'm very happy to be invited here. So the way we view open science, of course, it's access to journals, also to data and new open metrics. Uh, we also think there's an element here about research integrity and whether data and research is reproducible, about reproducibility. And of course, as you know, science for society and maybe also science by uh, citizens. And underpinning all of that is open tools and software. 
Now, um, at Elsevier, we uh, were maybe a bit hesitant to uh, embrace open access like 10 years ago, uh, but I think we definitely have caught up. I think we're one of the largest uh, open access publishers today. Uh, science, of course, is, uh, size is not that, uh, that important, but it's tr certainly in our mindset. And I think it's uh, also for all the SCM publishers, open access is the way to go. And the question is not uh, if, but how we're going to uh, make this happen. And so, for instance, today we have uh, 370 fully open access, bold open access titles. You can publish uh, open open access articles in all our journals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, underlying that are these uh, large agreements that we have with universities or groups of universities, or sometimes with whole countries. Um, and one of them is here in the Netherlands, where I am based. And I was involved in those discussions, so uh, I can say a little bit more about that. But there's also an example here from France with Couperin or the Sw Switzerland, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and other element of open access, of course, the preprint servers. Uh, we have SSRN in our family. Um, and so you see here some examples, all COVID related. Um, uh, during the Corona crisis, there was, of course, this incredible pressure to have scientific uh, findings um, available immediately. Uh, and of course, the publishers, they rose to that challenge and, and elsewhere as well. So we, we had a COVID-19 uh, uh, resource center. Uh, but we saw also um, that uh, the preprints uh, were playing a crucial role there. Sometimes um, also a bit, uh, you know, uh, there were some preprints which were questionable. And then the discussion started, you know, should there not be some kind of quality assessment about preprints, which of course uh, is interesting because the preprints were always like, no, this is the raw version. This is the version before uh, 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 peer review. Uh, so they are just there to share information as rapidly as possible. Uh, but we could see that some or people or, uh, used actually preprints, not in that pure scientific way, but also, uh, for instance, for political purposes, uh, which was, uh, you know, not, not at all what it was intended for. At the same time, we were also flooded with manuscripts. Uh, so for instance, the Lancet, uh, I think their, the inflow of manuscripts was like four times as high. Um, and a, a real challenge how to kind of deal with all of that and at the same time maintain uh, that quality, which we will never compromise on in the peer review system. We actually did use some kind of simple AI to select the articles dealing with COVID so that they would be fast track uh, without, as I mentioned before, uh, compromising on the peer review system. Another alternative here, which we offer is digital comments. So it's perfect for um, like local uh, language journals or uh, journals which are just uh, kind of emerging or uh, in the arts and humanities and the social sciences. Uh, it's fair to say that Elsevier as a whole, we're very much uh, focused on science, technology and medical, but we definitely also here uh, support uh, other types of, of journals. Now, moving on away from open access to open data, uh, that is something that has been on our agenda for a long time. And we really encourage um, our authors to share uh, their data as much as possible. And you see here a little bit uh, how it goes from very light sharing <laughs> uh, to on the right, uh, like the, the way it should be shared. So data is deposited. Uh, there is peer review on the data. Uh, and data is, of course, all findable and linkable and searchable. We, um, we also are active in the area of open metrics. So we have our own international center of uh, study of research. So we, we, we do research on research. Uh, and there we have uh, many, many uh, databases, like for instance, around Scopus, which you make freely available uh, to do research with. Um, and then finally, uh, all the aspects of, of doing research. So not only writing an article, but for instance, you could publish just a data set, or you could publish uh, the method. And if that article if that about the method is then accepted, um, then we guarantee that the outcome will also be uh, published. Uh, and sometimes the outcome is a null result. And I think we also want that published. Uh, if you make a contribution in hardware or software, then that's important to be published as well. So you get credit for that. Um, and of course, um, you know, we are very active in research for life so that researchers in the global south have access 
and also uh, uh, can be supported if they don't have the fees for uh, uh, open access payment. We have uh, different uh, programs for disadvantaged communities, for patient access, access for journalists, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, um, you know, if you talk about open tools and software, we have our own Mendeley platform, which is used widely. Um, and also there are data sets can be stored there. Now let's move on and, and focus on the Netherlands, the country where I, where I am. Um, so we signed two and a half years ago an agreement with the Dutch universities, but also the national funder and WO um, and supported by the Royal Academy. Um, and part of it is kind of traditional, so access to all our journals and open access or called open access components. So the Dutch scientists can publish as much as they want, unlimited number of uh, gold open access articles. Um, and which is great if you're a researcher at the Dutch university, you don't even notice, you just publish. Um, but then we decided together that we were going to in, in, in invest in open science pilots. And that's something we would co-create, as the, my English colleagues always say. Um, and, and when we started in the first year, the Dutch University spent more or less a year uh, talking about a framework, uh, a governance structure. Now, of course, if you're in a hurry, uh, this is just slightly frustrating, but we thought it was a very good discussion and we were kind of supporting this, although in the end it's the universities who came up with this framework. And I think there are four important criteria here. One is this interoperability and vendor neutra neutrality. So we will guarantee that if they work with us, that's absolutely fine. But if they want to work with another vendor, that's absolutely fine as well. So there are no solutions which are strictly only working for else-free products and services. Then we will be very transparent and inclusive of how everything is being built. Um, the research data is, of course, not owned by Elsevier, it never will be, it's owned by either the individuals, the institutions, or maybe the funders. Um, and then if they decide after, you know, periods like, oh, the pilot was interesting, but we'll stop it, or the service we have been subscribing to, we don't like it anymore, we will then give back all the data, just like you can switch provider uh, with your mobile phone. And so I think these four principles are very important. We were happy with them. The universities um, are happy with them as well. And this is the basis for the pilots that we've been developing over the last two years here. And this is an overview um, of the ones which are on the agenda now. So this is, I like it because it's a very concrete way of saying, what can you do together to make an open science a reality? So the first one, for instance, um, is public portals and showcasing for the Amsterdam University Medical Centers. We have two uh, universities here. They had their own medical centers. They merged. And now together, they kind of showcase everything they were doing, not only in articles, but also on clinical trials and everything else they want to share with the broader community, with the patient community, et cetera, et cetera. That is a pilot that is finished. Uh, and I think, uh, the, <coughs> sorry, the, AU, the UMC was very happy with it. Then uh, we are now working on a what we call data monitor. So we know data sets are there, and we know that scientists are very creative to store their own data. Sometimes it might be in an institutional repository, sometimes in a subject repository, sometimes it's somewhere else. Uh, so what we're doing here is really making this connection between the data set and the article and then link the article to the universities. So then you say you're at the University of Maastricht, then we can, can show that these are all the data sets that come from researchers at the University of Maastricht. Um, of all the Dutch universities, I think almost all of them signed up for it and we're working on that. Uh, and so if you then go to the University of Maastricht, it shows that it's their data set. It's not like it's hosted by Elsevier or uh, it's really the University of Maastricht is kind of displaying all the, the, the data sets that are associated with the research they are performing. Then the third one is about funding. So originally we hoped that we would work with NWO. And so we would know all the funds which are going to the Dutch universities and the Dutch universities would do research <clears throat> and then have output like articles, but also societal impacts. That turned out to be a bit difficult. Uh, NWO was hit by a, a, a cyber attack. Uh, so we've been working here with European funding uh, first and NWO will follow shortly. 
but it's really important that we can kind of see that the euro, which is invested, you know, goes into the whole resource system <clears throat> and what is the outcome in the end. And it's not so easy today to link all these systems together. Um, and then, so we're exploring other ones. So uh, one is, for instance, about uh, rare diseases. Uh, one is about, uh, you know, telescopes. So if you have big uh, instruments, which you're all using together as universities, so how can you kind of see how the collaboration works and also measure the output? So these are just, you know, we are halfway the program. It's a five-year program. It's now two and a half years, exactly midway point this summer. Um, and so um, I think the, the, the future is exciting because if I would be speaking here in two years, I think we'll do many more pilots together with Dutch universities and the Dutch funders. And I think that is my last slide, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Michiel. Um, that was a very different uh, view on open science, which uh, I think is great because I think that's the strength of this channel, that we have so many different uh, perspectives and, and understandings of open science. Um, just to remind you, uh, I kindly ask you to, um, to, to put your questions in the Q&A, but we will get to them uh, after the last presentation. So now I would like to invite Ernesto, who has uh, joined us, um, to speak. So Ernesto is uh, um, from the uh, University of, wait, just let me look it up. It's uh, University of Talca in Chile. And um, he is a discipline is operations management, and uh, he has been for a long time an associate editor and editor and uh, member of editorial boards at journals, among others from Elsevier, but also other publishers. And um, uh, so Ernesto will now talk about his take on open science, especially from an editor's perspective and anything else you might want to add, Ernesto. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Christine, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, uh good, good good afternoon uh, good morning from this side of the of the world and in south america now so sorry for the background noise this activity got me on the road and i have to to find a place to to connect okay? well briefly uh, i did my doctorate in the operations management and operations research i work in the area of sustainability and the climate change and as an associate editor of multiple journals edited by Elsevier, Springer, and Emerald, was an impact factor vary between four and, and 12. And for more than 10 years as associate editor of the journal of clinical action, I had the good opportunity to work at the beginning with the founder of the journal who invited me to set up the area of operation management, operation research, and decision making in the journal. At that time, we received, uh, 10 years ago, we received about 3,000 submissions a year. Currently, we receive more than 20, 25,000 submissions a, a year. So we grow uh, very much in the, in, in the number of uh, actually editors. Eh? So from that editor perspective, as Christian said, I have to I, I have had to work uh, with a large number of uh, authors and reviewers uh, in addition to fellow uh, editors and, and publishers. And of course, I have been close to the evolution of uh, open science and in particular the efforts of several publishers to open science in society. Uh, beyond the scientific world and researchers. Therefore, uh, I would like to say that my vision may be based in that uh, sense. I, I have formed the idea that the impacts of uh, open science should be analyzed from different perspectives, including the benefit to society, but also from the legal economics point of view and the impact on the evaluation of researchers themselves. Uh, there is still a certain uh, prejudice yeah, against a uh, publishing in journal in which uh, you must uh, pay to publish uh, the APC yeah? uh, as they are a lower quality. And in some cases, this is totally overcome. Uh, it seemed to me that a central issue in these uh, cases where you pay to publish, I refer to the APC, looking at it uh, as a salary uh, is accountability for the way in which the money received is uh, used by publisher and uh, journals. 
And let me refer a little about accountability, eh? where those who benefit from publication rights payment details in the report how these resources are used, considering, for example, the impact on society and the environment. More specifically, uh, I would like to say that, uh, for example, we could refer here the aid that it can be given to researchers from less developed countries where there are no resources to pay for publication, for example, and whether where there are that there was a, a lack of resources to, to investigate, of course. Eh? Uh, the aid to participate in events and, uh, and even partial or total scholarship that could be founded by the publisher or, or journal. This is part of uh, what I said, accountability could be a good, uh, a good strategy, a good strategy to, to, to also collaborate with open science. Eh? We should also, for a similar so a look carefully at the statistics on the impact of open access. Uh, uh, well, uh, without a doubt, researchers from countries with uh, more resources in which there is a greater access to budget to pay for publication will also be favored uh, in publication uh, statistics uh, impacting the medium and long term in, for example, age industries. Uh, number of citation among other things. Uh, therefore, also open access, I feel a strategy that contribute to open science. As I said at the beginning, it to reanalyze it from multiple perspectives. Let me refer to one true additional point. In addition to APC, an open access strategy, as explained by, by Michael Early, Publisher and journal are making different efforts, for example, to open the data, use it in the region that is uh, published. However, little interest has yet been seen from researchers in some uh, journal. And it may be because uh, that uh, publication do not have an impact on the evaluation of their performance in the institution in which they work, or also by the government when they apply to research uh, projects. So this is a point that we need to consider too. Uh, uh, finally, the possibility of generating or producing videos associated with scientific articles and publishing them on an open platform is uh, another initiative that journal and publisher are adopting. And uh, that could can be interesting to bring the science uh, closer to society beyond the scientific uh, world. Thank you, thank you very much. That's what uh, I said now. Thank you very much, Ernesto, for sharing your, your thoughts on the topic and for your experience, uh, much more kind of micro practically uh, informed uh, um, uh, argument, I think, or our thoughts, um, uh, which is a great connection to our last Speaker, which is Maximilian Heimstedt from the University of Bielefeld and also um, Weizmann Institute in Germany. And uh, Maximilian does actually research on open science in its various instantations. You are much better equipped to talk about this yourself, Maximilian. And I think you will also talk about uh, platforms and preprints. So there's a great connection to what Michiel talked about. And I uh, cannot um, help but think that you will also talk about some of the points that Ernesto mentioned uh, with regards to individual researchers uh, and their, the, the kind of ramifications that um, uh, open science and in particular, uh, for example, preprints can have. So the floor is yours, Maximilian, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I'm, it seems that I'm sort of speaking for the management community here. It's, um, besides Ernesto. So I'm a management researcher, but I'm also interested in open science. So on the one hand, I used to study how we can manage or organize the transition towards open science. So that I looked at open science as a management problem, but I'm also very interested in how open science changes the way we do management research. And this has been um, my interest since I started my PhD dissertation. Um, and I looked at things, for example, like the rise of predatory publishing, which we haven't spoken about today, but that's something which was very prevalent in the management field. Lots of predatory journals target management manuscripts, if you want so. Um, and, but for today, I thought, so I kind of assumed that we will have 
a few like more macro policy oriented contributions here. So I decided to uh, drill down and focus only on one issue, which is the role of preprints in management studies, because uh, I think there are so many different open science practices, open access, open data, open peer review, and we could probably fill an uh, entire panel for each of them. <laughs> so I thought a focus on preprints and um, as Michel uh, already said, uh, so he probably comes from the community where preprints have been sort of invented, <laughs> um, like high energy physics and preprints as such are not a new phenomenon at all. So it's probably one of the oldest open science practices, if you want. So, so as Michel said, it's uh, the first preprint server was set up, I think, in 94 um, archive. And um, but for a long, long time, preprints, um, so manuscripts which are intended for peer review, but which have either not been submitted to peer review yet or which have not completed peer review yet. So that's what I define as a preprint. Um, they have been circulated in some fields um, like high energy physics, like the early 90s. But I would say for a very long time, um, management research uh, hasn't really become aware of the fact that preprints are a thing or it was just so that the practice didn't diffuse to the field of management research. Um, and what I observed, and I'm not the only one here, is that there was something like a, a second wave of preprint servers. I think that's what it has been called uh, on some blogs, which uh, is about like, let's say five or six years ago. So five or six years ago, we, can, we saw that uh, the number of preprint servers, so platforms that host preprints has not exploded, but um, has grown from like five or 10 to over 60 preprint servers today. And my impression is that uh, after this uh, explosion in the number of preprint servers, the issue has also become more prevalent in the field of management, but I think this is kind of the, the one of the frontiers of open science. So uh, it's still mostly unknown to the majority of management scholars, but I think we should speak about preprints more. And um, I think what's uh, particularly for the field of management studies, there are at least two reasons that speak in favor for sharing preprints more openly and not only our finished journals. The first one is, and this applies to most other fields as well, the rigor argument, right? I think Michelle, you also spoke about this. It's kind of the idea that if you share a preprint upfront or maybe in parallel to the peer review process, you have this idea of uh, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So the more people look at your preprint, the more bugs could be spotted. You get the, like loads of great recommendations of how you can improve your manuscript. I think that's the rigor argument. But then in management, you also have the relevance argument. So um, I would say that management is a field that, or the legitimacy of the management field also derives from being relatively quick. So there are changes in the way management is done in organizations or like, like changes in the world and management studies should respond not with a like 10 year delay, but we want relatively, it's a relatively applied field. Um, so, and I think oftentimes, when management scholars face the criticism that we are not relevant enough, it's also because our publication processes take a very long time. If you want to go like publish your stuff in a top management journal, it could, can take sometimes six or seven years from like start of the project to completion. Um, not in all journals, but like if you want, like if you aim high, this is not uh, unrealistic. So I think sharing preprints in management studies could be a way to um, gain some ground compared to this other industry like management gurus or consultants, which are kind of the sort of the competitors of management scholars or all those people who also write smart books about management problems, but who don't have to deal with peer review at all because they're not in academia. They are self-employed management consultants or so. So I think that's maybe more specific to our field. If we submit our stuff to the top journals, but at the same time um, publish a preprint, we can use this preprint to reach maybe practitioner audiences early on. Um, but then, <laughs> and here maybe I'm, um, I wanna go beyond what I think, especially Jeannie mentioned in her presentation. I think um, it's not, 
only a matter of personal choice in the field of management research. So sometimes we think about, okay, why don't we all share preprints? Ah, we're just too anxious. <laughs> or it's just, if we just get more courage, then science would be more open. But in my personal experience, there are, um, there's at least one, I think, hurdle from an institutional perspective. And um, this is that a lot of journals are very unclear in their policies. So um, I always, like I always thought about, I want to share my preprint in a management journal, but then um, when I submitted the editorial management system, usually nowadays, they even have a slot for here you can post the link to your preprint. But then um, if I look into the guidelines of how I'm supposed to behave as a management researcher, it also tells me, make sure um, you comply with the double blind peer review policy of our journal, otherwise we kick you out. So management scholars here, maybe others as well, <clears throat> kind of end up in a double bind situation. We think, okay, on the one hand, you encourage me to share my preprint, but then you say, I'm not allowed to associate my name with the title of the manuscript online, which is kind of, uh, yeah. So uh, that's a very hands-on <laughs> hurdle I see here. So which I think can be fixed. Um, but the second larger proposal, and maybe this goes in the direction of the provocation we should do is, um, in my understanding, there is no dedicated preprint server, pre server for management research. So um, if I look where I find preprints today is it's either on SSRN, which is um, in the Elsevier family, as you put it, or there's the community run or one of the community run competitor preprint servers, which is SOC Archives, mainly run by the sociology community, which was founded at the same time or as a response to Elsevier acquiring SSRN, if I'm correctly informed here. So <laughs> I think one of the things we could discuss later on is whether these preprint servers, if we accept that preprint servers are important infrastructures, and I think many of us would agree with this, uh, at least based on our presentation, the question is, should they be uh, run by the community? Um, or is it okay if preprint servers are also run by publishing companies? And I think the academic community is split on this question. Um, I'm, I don't have a fixed position here, but I think what's very important, and this would be also my question in the direction of Michelle, is how the governance structure of these preprint servers is organized. Because what I think what the corona pandemic showed is that preprint servers need some sort of content moderation. So we like to present them as, as neutral infrastructures, but I think this is a huge threat. So if everybody can just post anything on a preprint server, and call it science or science in the making, um, this could have very, uh, like a lot of negative consequences. For example, then if these um, studies get picked up by the media. So I think there should be some sort of like quality filter, um, light touch quality filter as it's um, implemented on the archive preprint server. Um, and this quality check should be performed by the academic community, in our case, of management researchers themselves. So, uh, yeah. And I know that these kind of systems are in place, for example, like community-run preprint servers like SOC Archive, but I'm not entirely sure how this works in the SSRN universe. So if there are any quality checks or not. And yeah, so my final provocation is, because I think there should be a community-run preprint server for management studies. And if some or host of today um, claims that they define themselves as the United Nations of scholarly management associations, um, I think they are in a perfect position to um, get some funds from their members, for example, the very well-endowed Academy of Management, <laughs> um, to fund their own uh, management preprint server. That's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Maximilian. That's uh, ending on a high provocation indeed. And uh, I see that we have Xavier Castanier uh, among uh, the participants, the audience here, who is the president of IFSAM. 
So um, perhaps uh, now that we all have, have uh, heard uh, your take on open science, we uh, can invite the audience to speak. And Xavier um, uh, also asked the question in the Q&A. So please, dear uh, audience, uh, come up with your questions. Uh, you can also just ask them in person. And, um, and then um, I would invite the, the panelists to answer. And also, if you uh, as panelists want to uh, you know, re reply to each other, please just unmute yourself and do so. So Xavier, are you there? Can I allow you to talk? Yes. Yes, there you are. Thank you, Christine. Thank you all for um, your wonderful presentations. I guess you want me to uh, state my question. Christine, is that it? Uh, yes, and also perhaps you could start with responding to Maximilian's suggestion, which was uh, <laughs> to host our own preprint server for management studies. <laughs> because uh, so the claim is uh, there should be at least uh, the quality check should be done by the community, which we probably all agree on because uh, that's what we do in peer review. However, then who is in charge? What's the governance structure? And I know that that's also something that Michiel has been uh, engaging with, the governance structure. So I would be very interested on, also in, in your uh, reply to this, Michiel. But perhaps, uh, Xavier, so how do we do it? How does if some host uh, our own preprint server? <laughs> I think that that's a wonderful idea that we should definitely study and discuss, both at the board of directors and at the General Assembly. Uh, the Federation has not that many uh, resources currently. Uh, oh, I think Shami is gone. No, wait. Just unmute. He's on mute. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was promoted to, um, to panelists, so that's why I think there was the... Uh, the, uh, ah, there you are. the change. So I think it's a wonderful idea and we should explore it for sure. We have limited resources. Each member association, full members contribute 1100 euros a year and uh, associate members half of that. So we have currently limited financial capacity, but you mentioned that there is there are member associations in the Federation which have a lot of resources. So that's definitely something that, that we should be discussing. So thank you so much again for your provocation, and it's a great, great suggestion, really. Um, so we'll we'll put it in the agenda. <laughs> I can promise that. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my question was to Ginny in terms of, um, I guess, also to Michiel uh, and others. But uh, um, the, the um, in this new world of open science and its very many different dimensions. What is the role that, uh, in your in your view, uh, from your experience, have had the scholarly associations uh, in general, not necessarily management, and if you can comment on the management ones, but in general, and what should be the role that you think that scholarly associations should have in defining this new world? Thank you. So shall I, I'll take maybe I'll kick that off. So I think I think scholarly associations are absolutely critical to this. I mean, you know, they're academic led. That, but you know, by definition, I think I would I would really welcome them engaging as much as possible, in it and not just it being led by you know um, by publishers, commercial publishers or otherwise. I think it's very variable by discipline. So we've as we've heard, you know, for example, in physics, there's a huge already a move to make research. Um, engagement in open science with in the humanities there's been more concerns about it because you know it's not it's not as simple you know it's there's a big difference between for example if you're publishing monographs versus publishing um you know publishing more traditional research papers and you know when you go out into say arts and humanities you know arts and you know then you're talking about non-traditional research outputs that it becomes much more complex what i am seeing is that you know again i've been in this space for quite some time is that for the, the kind of the concern that people had maybe five or 10 years ago is now people are now saying, well, how do we do this? Not, you know, this is not something we want to engage with. And I really would urge societies to take the lead in this area, because otherwise the risk is, to be honest, is we get commercial publishers only taking the lead in it or other actors. And, you know, then it becomes, you know, not appropriate for society. So that's my why my provocation was, you know, to really say you know step up and make your voice heard about what you think is appropriate for your discipline 
thank you very much, Ginny. So do you have any thoughts on how we could do that um, before we move on to our next uh, question? Well, I, I would say that, I mean, I've talked a bit about the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation. I would really urge you to look at it because one of the key things that they, you know, they're now working through a whole set of processes for how that a, a recommendation gets implemented. And the first one is actually to make sure to un come to a common understanding of what open science means. And I think that, you know, often, you know, when you have conversations with in individuals or groups, this may be the first time they've all even th thought about it. They've only thought about open access. Maybe they've thought about open data. They haven't thought about the whole suite of it. So I think things like this are incredibly important. Socializing it across your networks and and really having conversations at the local level about what it means individually. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is a great time to invite Katie Mason uh, to answer her question. Katie, I think um, you are still there. Let me just um, give you a chance to ask your question yourself. And I will promote you to panelists, which means you should be able to talk. Let's see. No, it doesn't work. Oh, it does. Yes, it does. Katie, uh, go ahead, please. Hello, sorry, I just uh, had to reconnect as a panelist there. Um, so um, thank you very much for a really interesting session. Um, my, uh, I'm, I'm chair of the British Academy of Management and um, actually journal income is a really important way of bringing in income to perform activities that support our members. So I think that open access uh, represents um, quite an interesting um, um, challenge for our community in the way that we think about how we're funded and uh, our own business model. Um, but it also represents challenges when we want to do something new. So we've been really keen to launch a new journal and um, we've spoken to a number of publishers and we found it really challenging. And the question is to us from the publishers, how are you going to make money from doing this? And we're a learning society, just like if Sam run on the contribution of our members um, with limited income, limited professional support, though we do have a fantastic office. Um, and, and so I'd just like to ask that question is how, how can learning societies be supported to, um, you know, grow the areas of knowledge and be part of this open science community that we're not against in any sense of the imagination, but um, it does promote promote and present certain challenges. Michiel, would you like to take that uh, question? Yeah, so I'm not that familiar with exactly, of course, this society, um, but we uh, as publishers and certainly at Elsevier, we publish many journals on behalf of societies. I, I certainly know, you know, medical societies, etc. Um, and, and if the society wants an open access uh, model, then we are very happy to support that. Uh, open access model comes also with a certain level of income, and that, of course, flows then back uh, to a certain amount to, to the societies. So, yeah, maybe the, the publishers you've been talking to are a bit uh, conservative. I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I was a bit surprised, but it could also be that, you know, in, in your community, it, yeah, it's more difficult. Uh, the, the funding is not that readily available in general. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why publishers might be a bit, you know, reluctant to kind of uh, jump in and, and say, yes, we go for an open access journal. But in principle, you know, it makes no difference, you know, whether the reader pays or the author pays. Uh, you do need a sustainable model because you want to kind of guarantee that your journal is high quality, that it's, uh, uh, you know, that peer review is well, uh, well in place uh, and all the other guarantees uh, that, that you want for a high quality journal. So, but in principle, it should work. I, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Mikael, which is most of business and management research is unfunded by um, the country's uh, learned uh, um, uh, research support agencies, which are government backed. And that's a big challenge for our community, and uh, particularly for business and management as a field. Yeah. Um, and it means that there isn't money for the authors to pay. Also, there's a real challenge around open access with the amount of time it takes to publish a paper. So quite often it's three to five years, um, whereas in something like maths or physics or medicine, it's much quicker. Yes, um, much. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so that, that presents very particular challenges. So the grant stops and the money stops, and therefore the publication has no money attached to it 
because you can't do it within the yeah. time frame of the project. Yeah. So th those things do uh, present particular challenges for our communities. And I see many universities starting looking at their own publishing houses, which could actually tip things on their head a little bit. Um, and it might also mean that the monograph rears its head at a really important route of publication compared with the journal. Mm. Um, so I think those are all big questions for IFSAM going forward. And it's really great to see open access being discussed in this way on this panel. And Christine, Could do you want me to circle back to the, the preprint uh, discussion later or maybe yeah, exactly. Jeannie is going to answer yeah. first. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. No, no, I, uh, Jenny, uh, you go first and then it would be interesting to see Michiel's take on the if some uh, preprint server take yeah. and the quality <laughs> assurance, especially because there was also another question in the in the chat. Yeah. Go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, I, I just I just wanted to respond to Katie's question about launching a journal. I think that one of the things I didn't really have time to talk on, but it's the whole concept of diamond open access journals. So the no fee for publishing free to read um, journals. And this is something that, again, has been really identified by Coalition S as a really high priority for them. Um, so I would there's actually work happening right now. In fact, I think there's a conference next week part physical and online about the future of diamond open access publishing and I would really encourage you to to look at what has been done there because one of the things that they are proposing is how do we actually um, for example come up with a funding structure that can support journals like you know, yours that don't necessarily have funding for researchers I mean I think we all thought right at the very beginning that it would be very easy to flip the business model but clearly we can't turn the inability to read into the inability to publish and so it's very important that we think about funding on a really national level and that's happening it's already happened in south america you know in australia that's there's a conversation happening there so i i there's a lot happening in this space i think you might find some opportunities you know coming up fairly shortly thanks can, indeed, I, can, I pop, can i pop things into the chat and people will see them all i can put some links in that will, if that's useful i think you can put it in the chat and then you direct it to everyone that's how to do it I mean, so, I can add to what Ginny was saying. So in many countries, there are transformative agreements, like in the Netherlands. Uh, and that also applies if you're a scientist uh, or a researcher in, in management science. Uh, you can publish as, as many gold open access uh, articles with Elsevier, and I'm sure also with the other publishers, uh, if there are, if there are uh, transformative agreements in place. Um, and then, you, yeah, so you don't see the cost as an individual scientist or as an individual university because there's a collective agreement. The preprint servers, perhaps? I would say, yes, go for it. Um, uh, the space is big enough uh, for, for all of us, uh, so to say. I, when I remember when I was uh, in astronomy, I, I was a member, of course, of, the, uh, of my society. I felt very closely connected. I was very happy that that society had its own journal. I published there. Um, I was also happy there were alternatives. I don't think I only wanted always to publish only in society journals. Um, I think it would be good to have some you know, competition there uh, from all kinds of other uh, publishers, whether they're society publishers or uh, non-for-profits or for-profits. And I think the same applies uh, to uh, the preprint server. So yeah, I mean, absolutely uh, launch it. Um, I should say for the journals, I'm more familiar with that. Of course, we have strict editorial uh, autonomy. It's the editor that decides that there's no interference whatsoever from the publisher. If I would tell an editor, please accept this, journal, this article, this would be the last conversation I would have at Elsevier. And that's exactly how it should be. And I, I, I can imagine for the, the preprint servers, of course, uh, um, it's also an independent organization uh, that, that, that should monitor the, the, the quality. I do not know exactly uh, what is it. SSRN for, for that quality assurance. I do feel there is a bit of a blurred line, right? So before preprints were automatically accepted, and then you go to peer review, and on the other end, and apparently it takes years in, in management sciences, you have the accepted articles. Uh, and that line is now being blurred a bit. So we see that the preprints, and they need some kind of uh, quality assurance. And then on the journal side, we want fast track. So it's almost like a preprint plus or something. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and I worry a little bit, you know, whether that's a good thing, because it might lead to some level of, of confusion. It must be very clear uh, what we're talking about. So this is something which is being 
scrutinized, whether it's it's right or being revised at Elsevier, an article on average is revised two to three times before it's accepted. And of course, we only accept uh, a quarter of the articles and reject uh, 75%. Um, and that is the quality assurance you get. And if it's not clear where you are in that process, it might be very confusing. Scientists understand it, researchers understand it, but the moment you share it with, uh, with a broader audience, and I could see that already during, uh, during the Corona crisis, even in the New York Times, I saw articles written about preprints as if these are the, the results. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I, that, that gets a little bit tricky. I do like it, for instance, when Fauci was uh, testifying in the, the US Senate and he was asked, so what is your, you know, what are your policies based on? And he would say, it's based on these kind of articles. And by chance, he had an article from Cell Press from Elsevier, but it could have been, of course, from any uh, reputable publisher. This is reliable information. This is trustworthy information. And I think, you know, uh, the, the, the pandemic showed uh, that that is even more important than ever before. So I, I think um, the reliable bit is, I think that's extremely important. And even in the good journals we have seen, especially in the Netherlands, a few cases of um, uh, really heavy fraud. So it's not a 100% uh, uh, watertight system, is it? So Michiel, how would you see uh, the quality assurance bit in the future? So given that now it's a blurred, uh, blurred line, let's say, let's agree on the gray zone there, how would you organize it? And then I would like to invite Ernesto to reflect on how would you organize this as an editor? How would you organize the preprint thing? As I can also see, like the, uh, for example, publishing express uh, manuscripts, which is uh, after peer review but before curating, right? And that's already a task that the associate editors uh, take on them. So please, Michiel, make a start, and then we. Uh, I would like to hear Ernesto. Yes, so I, I, I very much believe that uh, if you just look at the journal articles, the peer review system is not perfect, but it's certainly the best system we have. And we will keep uh, working on it to make it even better and better. It's a pretty inefficient system, to be honest, because an article has a, a long lifetime. It might go to journal A and reject it, and then go to journal B and reject it. Uh, and that puts a burden on, on the referees and therefore on, on, on the scientific community. So we are thinking whether we can optimize that. So if a journal is rejected but with a good referee report, can it not be kind of fast-tracked and accepted somewhere else without going through a very detailed uh, refereeing process again? Um, there were a few cases, well, of course, um, yeah, we must be very careful to, to make sure that the articles are not submitted that uh, actually are plagiarized. So I think we're doing a pretty good job of catching that. Um, then if you look at, for instance, data fabrication or uh, image, uh, menu, uh, figure image manipulation, that's an area, you know, we're really uh, investing in now, uh, which is very important, a bit more complicated. I think open science is there really helpful. Uh, there were a few controversial articles during the corona crisis, which were accepted uh, by leading journals, including uh, the Lancet, but also New, New uh, England Journal of Medicine, uh, which turned out that the articles themselves were completely kosher. There's nothing wrong with them. But there were flaws in the underlying database, which were not made available. And I think that was not really a case of where peer review uh, kind of uh, failed. It was a case where open science was not in operation. And had it been, had the database been freely available to everybody, which I am a strong uh, opponent of, proponent of, proponent of, um, then this would not have happened because then people could have scrutinized the underlying data and thought, oof, something is fishy here, this cannot be right. And of course, uh, that led to retractions of articles, which is, is something we, we always want to prevent. Thank you. Ernesto, how do you think about, uh, um, how could we organize quality assurance on, on preprint service? You're on mute, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, first, first of all, I, I think that that depends uh, too much on the type of journal that we, we are we are talking about. Uh, let me let me say, for example, that uh, in journals where you receive a, a great number of submissions, uh, more than ten or fifteen thousand, that is the case a year. That is the case of some of the journals that I am involved with. What uh, the journals 
made is uh, to, to increase the number of associate editors. Uh, and that is, uh, has uh, two, two reasons. One is to, to have a quicker process in the, the peer review process. Yeah? And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the second one is uh, considering that uh, you have many fields in, in one of the, the journal, you have to allocate the appropriate uh, associate editor to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the paper, to the paper that is uh, submitted. So uh, that is also is going to benefit the author and also the journal because uh, if you have a good uh, associate editor assigned it or allocated to, to the paper uh, that is considered the field of the paper, so you can increase also the, the uh, lower, lower the time of the, 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 the review process. So uh, one, one of the one of the tracks that the journal like this are adopting is to increase the number of associate editors. But the other is to have a, a good number of uh, reviewers that uh, you can track the performance of the reviewers. And it, for that reason, also in some of the publisher system, you can rate the reviewer, and that is quite important that as the editor rate the reviewer, because if you have a, a good a, a good reviewer, you can also ensure that the quality the quality of the review process. But also, you can ensure that you can get a good and quality report on time. On time, eh? that's another good uh, good point. And uh, from the side of the of the reviewer, what is also good to have and uh, not many reviewers do, is also to rate the paper it, it, and rate the paper in, in, in a percentage. I mean, 50, 60, 70, 80, or in some journal, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, use just a, a little scale, one, two, three, uh, going to five. And, and that's also important because the, it's going to help the associate editor that is managing the journal to, to try to, to, to compare the quality of the revision with also uh, how each of the reviewer is rating the, 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 the paper that is submitted. So uh, in another strategy that is also going to, to benefit the author and the reviewer is to increase the number of uh, the editorial board. What what that means? Uh, typically, you have the editor in chief uh, of the journal, and you have a typically associate editor. In some journal, when you have a lot of submission, you need a different structure to also accelerate, make it quicker the review process. In that uh, new structure, for example, you include an executive editor. Uh, so the executive editor also has many, many assets editor, editor in charge, depending on the area of each uh, executive editor. And that is also going to increase because not the final decision is, is going to be uh, uh, depending on the editor in chief. It's, 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 uh, the editor in chief is uh, going to be helped with by the executive uh, editor in that way. Okay. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Thank you for, for the editor's take on this. So, um, and I would like to uh, ask Madeleine Barrows, you uh, put a question in the chat, and I think we this is exactly what we talked about. So how can we avoid possible damage by um, uh, the ad use uh, as it is of uh, preprint? So um, please, I promote you to panelists now. Let's see if it works. Um, Just takes a second, I think. Maybe there. Yes. Hi, Madeline. Would you like to add something to your question, or do you have an idea yourself how we could uh, how we could move forward? <laughs> No, I don't. Um, thank you, Christine. So I'm Madeleine Barrows. I'm the Chief Executive of the British Academy of Management. And as uh, Katie, my chair, has been saying, um, this is something that we're following with keen interest. Um, there are many problems here, um, but that was one in particular. And in fact, you have just addressed exactly those questions. Um, I think there's still a lot to discover um, 
and, and a lot to think about because no sooner do we change one thing than it has a, a rolling impact somewhere else. Uh, and there are always the unexpected, if unintended, consequences that we're, we're all um, very alert to. So thank you. Thank you thank to the you panel. It's been a very interesting part. discussion. Thank you. Uh, Maximilian, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I also found the question very interesting in the chat. I think it's now deleted, but you basically, so or at least I can't see it anymore. I think your question, Madeleine, was that um, how can we kind of deal with the risk that shady research is published as a preprint, right? And then uh, causes harm. And in a way, I think the answer is we, we can't. So in a way, if we accept this paradigm of open science in contrast to closed science, it's kind of, we, so we agree into a loss of control of some sorts, right? That's kind of the, the dark side of openness. If we want to share more like work in progress stuff, of course, there will be uh, not good or thorough research in there. And also preprint servers. And like, if we speak about the governance of preprint servers, um, any governance structure of a preprint server won't solve the question whether a paper is real science or not, because that's what the peer review does afterwards, right? So in my interpretation, what the governance of a preprint server should do is to uh, kind of identify the preprints that are deliberately deceptive. So th this is the right word. So like people who like <laughs> put up research with bad intentions, for example, science washing political agendas or deliberately spreading conspiracy narratives or something like that. And I think this is what an ideal governance setup of a preprint server could do. But then there's still a lot of preprints up there, which might just be badly executed studies, but at least people tried. So and I think that's okay. And we have to deal with that. Thank you, Maximilian. Uh, Ginny, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to, again, talk about just a little bit about the preprints from the point of view of my experience at Med Archive. So Med Archive is the medical um, uh, preprint server. It was founded by Cold Spring Harbour about about six and, and the British Medical Journal about um, about four months before the pandemic hit. And then it kind of came into its own during the pandemic. And I was involved in helping screen the papers there. And they had literally went from you know a trickle of papers through to thousands coming through and what they developed and what is i think has become a really great model is actually a sort of a, a very quick quality control process which essentially it's it's not completely automated some of it is but a lot of it is just highly is trained non-specialists who can find the kind of stuff that you're talking about Max, Max, you know where there's sort of something weird or you know you know there's things you can do for example you know in medic medicine it's very unusual say to have a single author you know that's a big red flag or you know impossible um uh you know kind of sample sizes from a really small institution there's there's things you can do and you know and what they've also done i think is drive the narrative around preprints being you know make it very clear these are non-peer reviewed and what you're now seeing because i think you know journalists in particular understand about med archive is they will say that this is a preprint so it's not been peer reviewed and so you know it gets reported reported appropriately so there are things that one can do in that space i think having the collaboration of cold spring harbor press and the bmj was specific particularly useful for med archive and that maybe is something to think about within your discipline when you launch your preprint server <laughs> Uh, and as you say, when, not if. So there's a definite plan, and I'm sure Maximilian will be hired as an advisor here. <laughs> so um, thanks, everyone. I would like to very quickly summarize, um, I think, the main points uh, that I think have been discussed, and then give my panelists a last chance to provocate or to summarize or to uh, make claims for the future. So the the um, the question for today was to identify the opportunities and challenges for uh, open science and management research. And we have heard from uh, these, it's amazing to have had you all here, the different perspectives, especially uh, outside of management research, because uh, we never hear about this. And I'm sure um, I have never also talked with so many people outside of my discipline. So I feel this is a very rich uh, addition and thank you for that. Um, also, having you from the different parts of the world always uh, if some enriches the discussion. 
And I think that there's a few challenges that we have talked about. One is definitely the um, the uh, ambiguous rules, for example, as Maximilian said about the, the requirement for a double blind peer review, so the author should not be identified. However, the system nudges you to uh, share your preprints, so there's uh, uh, diverging um, information out there, which uh, for me also raises the issue of uh, the role of systems and technology in this, because um, we all know this is only going to grow, the role of technology in uh, for example, also providing quality assurance for, for the outliers in the preprint archives. However, there's also a danger of um, it, us trusting the system and then the system being ambiguous and so on. Um, uh, this also relates to the other point, uh, the challenge, which was the preprint abuse uh, in open science. And perhaps also this would uh, extend to data set abuse. So if all the data is uh, being shared and people abuse it in whatever way they come up with, um, then this is definitely a challenge we need to take care of. Um, uh, and, and here also the role of technology and perhaps especially algorithms and analyzing and managing such data and such preprints is not to be underestimated. And that's my own research on uh, algorithms and how it changes how we work. And uh, I think there's a very uh, real danger of us um, kind of outsourcing responsibility and our values, therefore, to technology, which we should be uh, definitely watch out for. And then uh, another challenge we haven't talked about, but it came up in our individual preparation talks, is um, that there's a question for management researchers who do qualitative research on how to engage with open science. So Ginny urges us to engage, and I do think that uh, there are, people are, uh, you know, they are not uh, uh, um, anti-open science or something, but uh, for, for portions of us, it's just very difficult, uh, especially uh, also uh, this hasn't been established, like Michiel's uh, discipline has been for uh, ever and ever more. But it's not so, and there are definitely challenges there uh, uh, in terms of privacy, in terms of ethics, also research ethics. So in a sense, we should also uh, trust our own values and in that sense also trust the authors of good quality articles in the preprints as well. Then on the upside, um, we should have a dedicated preprint server and there's a, a opportunity for if some definitely. I do think that we will look into it and let's see, um, maybe it isn't even uh, so expensive or um, let's see. There was uh, Jeannie's uh, suggestion to engage with a UNESCO framework to come to a common understanding of open science as a basis for future actions. Uh, look into different publication uh, uh, options, diamond open access, monographs to kind of resurrect the monographs. And, um, and also um, there was a definite, um, I think, call for action to uh, rethink the role of associations in particular uh, in terms of open science. So what can the associations do to first of all, create awareness and engagement? And secondly, to perhaps even self-organize to have these preprint service, but also um, information available uh, and, and uh, toolkits for the researchers that are united in their associations. So uh, I do hope that summarizes it. And uh, please, um, some final words. And I just follow my screen here. Ginny, um, please go ahead. It's a great summary. Thank you for that. I would just say, um, I, yes, please engage with open science. Um, I think what it does challenge us to do is to think about research as a continuum and, you know, we're not not thinking about, say, for example, the journal article as this final polished, beautiful thing. We, it's a, it's absolutely a continuum. It's from the data through to the, 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 the methodology through to the, you know, the different versions of papers. So think about thinking about it in that context, I think, provides more opportunities for engaging and, you know, applying that to your research. So. Yeah, have a have a think about the how open science can perhaps map on your your kind of research um, in in many different ways. Thank you, Jenny. Ernesto, you're next on my screen. Thank you, Christine. I, I would like just to close my participation with some uh, question about uh, the first one that was also addressed by some of my colleagues here in this panel is uh, what we understand for open science. Is it about just uh, open data, open access? What more we need to consider as part of an open science model? And how open science is founded? So resources uh, come from there. 
whether the many perspectives involved with in open science is uh, just uh, legal issues, for example, intellectual property, uh, economic aspects, uh, the society implications of open science, and how we promote a fair open science models. This means, uh, for example, how we live with these researchers and authors coming from less developed countries. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Um, Michiel, you're next on my screen. Yes, thank you. A well, great summary. Uh, and I'm a, a, a strong supporter of open science. Uh, what I did not hear in great detail, but Jeannie actually kind of kind of alluded to it, is a, a more inclusive approach uh, to research in, in general. So, uh, for instance, do more inclusive research. Uh, we know, for instance, if you look at medical studies, they're often done on, uh, on, on white males, uh, cisgender males often. Um, and, and so can we also not kind of address that, that, uh, that our research agenda is, is, is embracing diversity and inclusion. Um, and in general, uh, I would say, you know, uh, and that applies to publishers, but also I guess uh, to uh, the academic world, uh, diversity and inclusion is high on the agenda, but we're not there yet either. And those two things are not, of course, uh, disconnected. We're thinking about getting a better world, a more inclusive world, uh, and which applies both to the research agenda and that's, but also I think the way we, we, we share the outcomes of research, whether that's publications or data sets. Thank you. And Maximilian. Yeah, I also really enjoyed this discussion and I would have loved to keep on going. And I think um, a good takeaway for all of us would be to register a roundtable on open science in our national management association that we are here an association of. And I think I haven't seen one for the German uh, annual meetings, but I will register one for next year. So <laughs> I think we can Thank all... you. That's a great uh, idea. The Dutch don't have one, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but uh, so thanks everyone, all the panelists, but also uh, the audience, uh, people in the audience for uh, sharing this um, exploration with us. I really do think we have some tangible outcomes, which I had trust in all along. I'm not sure all my speakers had, but I'm sure you have now. So it was wonderful to meet all of you. And I do hope that we will continue the conversation uh, across the globe as it was today. Thanks everyone, we are done on time and um, have a good uh, if some conference and then also subsequent uh, association conference. Bye everyone. <laughs>